Hello and welcome back everybody to the second part of our paperclip special. If you haven't already done so, please make sure to watch episode one before you watch this episode here. It's gonna be somewhere here. If you already did, get ready and strap yourself in for the rest of the paperclip story. Welcome back, darlings. I'm Astrid Deinhardt. And I'm Anna Deinhardt. Last time we left off in early 1947 with Operation Paperclip facing public scrutiny and backlash. For a while it looked like Paperclip might end not even two years after it had begun. By then the mission had already had a name change from Operation Overcast to Paperclip and its purpose and rules had been altered. But Paperclip prevails, mainly because of new support when Truman signs the National Security Act on July the 26th, 1947. It introduces a new and soon invaluable player to the game, the Central Intelligence Agency. We call it the CIA. The CIA, today is known for its unscrupulous approaches, is arguably exactly dead from the very beginning. It sees the German scientists in a pure quid pro quo manner. What you did in the war does not matter. All that matters is how you can help the US beat the Soviets. There we go. In Operation Paperclip, the CIA found a perfect partner in its quest for scientific intelligence. And it was in the CIA that Operation Paperclip found its strongest supporting partner yet. With this renewed support from a novel partner in crime, as well as the public outrage eventually dying down, Paperclip remains. However, Almost two years after sidelining the State Department, the JIOA has still not issued a single visa to any German scientist. Even with official presidential support, some within the State Department continue to sabotage the project wherever possible. But one man especially has had enough of these shenanigans and takes matter into his own hands. Military Intelligence Chief General Stephen J. Chamberlain. On May 11, 1948, he approaches another American agency, the FBI, and pays its infamous director J. Edgar Hoover a visit. What is said in the meeting remains unknown. And it is unclear what, if anything, Hoover does. But suffice to say, three months later, the first visas are issued. Scientists in the Southwestern or Western United States accompanied by a military escort were driven in an unmarked army jeep out of the country to Mexico. With him, each scientist carries two forms of the State Department, I-55 and i 255, each bearing a signature from the Chief of the Visa Division and a proviso from the Joint Chief of Staff, Section 42323 of Title 22, signifying that the visa holder is a person whose admission is highly desirable in the national interest. After consulate approval, the scientists are then led back into the United States, no longer under military guard, but as a legal US immigrant in possession of a visa. The pathway towards citizenship has begun. If the scientists are located more in the northeastern parts of the US, then the same routine was followed, except with Canada replacing Mexico. Right, but even then, Paperclip is not a definite long-term program. Okay, so the longevity of the program has expanded even since its beginning. First, with the JIOA taking charge in late summer 1945, and once again in 1946, when the competition with the Soviets over the remaining German scientists intensified. But there is still at least a possibility that the initiative might end sooner rather than later. What if the tensions with the Soviets ease off, for example? 
Well, spoiler alert, they don't. They don't. <laughs> nah, they really don't. It was an international crisis in June 1948 that finally gave Operation Paperclip its long-term momentum. On June 24, 1948, the Soviets implement the Berlin blockade, which leads to the renowned Berlin airlift. This once and for all underlines that the former alliances between the USA and the Soviet Union has fractured beyond repair and reconciliation. In response to the unfolding crisis, the CIA redoubles its presence in Germany and the hunt for the remaining scientists on the list further intensifies and Paperclip picks up renewed speed and momentum. Speed and momentum which gets another push roughly a year later. On June 25, 1950, the Korean War begins. Now, as you may know, we have started a new series on the Korean War. If you didn't know, now you know. And after this, you should go right over to the Korean War channel to watch Indy and the first episodes. It's already action-packed and fascinating. <clears throat> as I was saying, right after the Korean War begins, Paperclip enters its final stage. Accelerated Paperclip or Project 63. The Americans feared that the Soviets could overrun Europe and, as such, an evacuation plan for dangerous Austrian and German scientists needs to be put into place. Imagine what could happen if they end up in the hands of the communists. These 150 scientists are put on a list named the K-List. The chief of staff quickly dispatched the special project team, which is equipped with a $1 million budget to get the K-list members. That's roughly $13 million today. Moreover, since many of these scientists do not have a job ready and waiting for them in the US, an entire block of rooms are set aside in a 19-story hotel on 71st Street and Broadway for a yet unnamed group of German scientists scheduled to arrive at a future date. Yes, this highlights that the US does not necessarily need these individuals. Instead, the only thing that matters is that the Soviets do not get their hands on them. Right? The army goes even further in an attempt to get the scientists on their side, remarking the US Army's primary interest is providing for your comfort, contentment, happiness and security. Efforts will be directed to help you in attaining these goals with a minimum friction, distraction and delay. But much to everyone's surprise, there aren't many takers. When the JIOA asks what the problem is, they are told that many of the candidates are too old, too rich, too busy and too thoroughly disgruntled with past experience with Americans. But there are some eager takers. Part of the Project 63 or Accelerated Paperclip is a denial program, in other words. Now the door was open to the worst of the worst. To illustrate, take the five categories employed by the Allies in the denazification program. Major offenders, offenders, lesser offenders, followers, and person exonerated. Major offenders would be war criminals, SS members, and so forth. Offenders were activists, militants, and profiteers, or incriminated persons. Lesser offenders were people who joined the NSDAP before 1937, Follows, followers were those who joined after, exonerated persons were those who, well, had nothing to do with the Nazis. It is important to stress that the boundaries between these categories are fluid and that the title of exonerated persons is rarely awarded. But here they just serve illustrative purposes. As you remember from the last episode in the early days of Paperclip, when it was still overcast on paper, only individuals in the exonerated and follower categories could be brought into the program. 
When the JIOA took over and the Soviet threat began to emerge with Cannon's long telegram in 1946, the language changed. No known or alleged war criminals and no ardent Nazis became no persons who might try and plan for the resurgence of German military potential. Right. This opened the door for anyone except category one major offenders. While the changed language may technically have allowed them in, the JIOA still refused to get the worst of the worst. At least on paper. They didn't have any qualms about the rocket scientists, despite that the Mittelbau Dora slave camp they participated in running was the worst Nazi labor camp imaginable, with death toll of 50,000. In any case, given the Korean War, everything is on the table, and under Project 63, even those belonging to Category 1 can immigrate to the USA. For example, Dr. Kurt Blume, former Deputy Surgeon General of the Reich and Chief Biological Weapons Expert. As we will soon discover, he has been working for the CIA in Germany since around 1947. However, it is only after Project 63 is initiated that he comes to the US. But once more, like in 1946, the press soon find out and the US administration faces another shitstorm. Dr. Walter Schreiber is another scientist who came to the US through Project 63 in 1951. During the war, he was medical general and head of the specialized department in the Reich Research Council. He was also a member of the NSDAP since 1933. He knew about and condoned the human experiments in Dachau. He asked the SS whether his vaccine could be used in human trials in Buchenwald and more. Altogether, someone firmly situated in category one of the scale of Nazi scum. After his arrival in the USA, a note appeared that Schreiber had just joined the staff of the US Air Force School of Aviation Medicine in Texas. Unlucky for him, an avid reader of the same journal and chief medical advisor at the Nuremberg Trials, Dr. Leopold Alexander, happens to read the announcement and he remembers Schreiber from the major war criminal trial in Nuremberg all too well. He writes to the director of the Massachusetts Medical Society at once. I regard it as my duty to inform you that the record shows that Dr. Schreiber is a thoroughly undesirable addition to American medicine, in fact, an intolerable one. He also informs the press. On September the 12th, 1951, the Boston Global's main headline reads, X Nazi high post with United States Air Force says medical man here. And like that, the cat is out of the bag. The FBI gets involved and the JIOA is suddenly sitting on hot coals. The Schreiber scandal could trigger a domino effect, shining an unwanted spotlight on the highly suspicious backgrounds of Dr. Struckholt, Dr. Benzinger, Dr. Konrad Schäfer, Dr. Becker Freising, Dr. Schröder, Dr. Ruff, and so many others. So after two weeks, Schreiber's contract in the US is cancelled and he is shipped to Argentina along with his wife. There he joins the other large number of Nazi undesirables who have managed to escape. Hey. We recently made an episode about just that, the red lines and the Nazi flight to Argentina. Check it out. And so, like before in 1946, the attention soon dies down. If it hadn't, since the public was already outraged by Schreiber, they may have been even more outraged by the other monsters shielded inside the CIA-JIOA partnership. As we mentioned, Dr. Kurt Blome, who in 1943 assumed responsibility for all research into biological warfare, sponsored by the Wehrmacht and the SS, and conducted live experiments with vaccines on concentration camp inmates, was another participant in Project 
63. Now, all we know for sure is that after he came to the US, Blume worked on Army 1952, Project 1975. Afterwards, his files remain empty. Blume is likely part of Project Artichoke. Artichoke and its predecessor Bluebird are top secret programs conducted by the CIA with the primary goal of seeing if a person can be involuntarily made to perform an act of attempted assassination or otherwise controlled. Hypnosis, LSD and innovative interrogation methods, aka torture, are employed towards that end. Its successor program is more widely known because of its moral abhorrence and ludicrous nature involving LSD to mind control subjects, MK Ultra. What well, we don't know for certain whether Blume was involved in MK Ultra or to what degree he was involved in Bluebird and Artichoke, the evidence points in one direction. Until the CIA decides to declassify its records on these programs properly, we cannot be certain. But he's not the only German scientist who has a hand in, shall we say, questionable US research. Dr. Friedrich Hoffmann helps the Americans produce their stockpile of the Nazi nerve agent Taboon after arriving in 1947. He participates in the CIA's assassination by poison program. He is even at the heart of the development of Agent Orange, the compound infamously used in Vietnam as a chemical herbicide and defoliant. Now, Hoffmann's involvement with Nazi ideology before and during the war remains unclear. But it is clear that he was a leading figure of the Nazi German nerve gas development program. The main reason he gets shielded by the US from any scrutiny seems to be that he happens to be the son-in-law of our old friend Erwin Respondek, who spied for the Allies together with US spy runner Sam Woods. Their story was one of the first we covered in this series and you have to go and see it. These two men are but two examples of German scientists who come to America through Overcast, Paperclip or Project 63 and use their talents for death and destruction anew, now in service to the United States of America. They also illustrate how closely Paperclip and the CIA were interlinked from 1947 until 1952. That is when the cooperation begins to fall apart. Since 1949, West Germany has had a new government and while the American High Commissioner still enjoys many freedoms and powers, he is no longer in charge. Unsurprisingly, the new German government under Konrad Adenauer does not appreciate American attempts to get German scientists out of the country. At this point, they are once again valued and welcome resources at home. The German government informs High Commissioner McCloy in 1952 that Paperclip violates NATO conventions and America's policies for governance in Germany. In turn, the Commissioner tells Washington that if Paperclip is not curtailed, it could result in a violent reaction from officials in West Germany. While the CIA is aware of these problems, its commitments to NATO rules or any rules are, mm, let's say, just say loose. But the chiefs of staff and, by extension, the JIOA do have to follow NATO rules more stringently. While the military begin dialing back their operations, the CIA continues recruiting German scientists. Now, at risk of losing control of the program, the JIOA throws concerns about NATO aside and sends out a new 20-man team to recruit more scientists. The situation is made worse by the CIA actively pursuing individuals on the original list 
of 1,000 scientists from 1946 and the 150 individuals on the Kalis from 1950. In other words, the very people the JIOA and Paperclip laid claim to. In effect, the corporation has turned into a bitter rivalry. As tensions with the German government rise, a US-German compromise is eventually reached. The JIOA will be allowed to continue pursuing any individual on the original thousand person list approved by Truman. An estimated 400 of them are still unrecruited, but besides those, everyone else was off the table. Nevertheless, from here on out, the story of the paperclip program and the JIOA is one of decline. While more scientists are being recruited with every passing year, the war moves further into the past. Many individuals who maybe would have gone to America in 1945 no longer see reason to. <clears throat> but there's one last exciting development before the end of the story. What would a story involving the CIA be without also evolving Soviet intelligence agencies? So, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Whalen joined the JIOA in 1957 and was promoted to Deputy Director in 1958. In this position, he has access to all sorts of research nodes of scientists working on atomic, biological and chemical weapons. He leaves the JIOA after one year at its post. It isn't until 1963 that the FBI learns that while in this position he had been passing information to Colonel Sergei Idemsky, a GRU intelligence agent posing as a military attaché in the Soviet Embassy in Washington. Worse, he had also destroyed thousands of paperclip files. Yes, it's a scandalous scoop. But the JIOA has been disbanded since 1962 and nominally controls of Paperclip has gone to the research and engineering department at the Pentagon. I say nominally because by then <clears throat> it was basically over and had effectively been dead in the water since 1959. So then, what's the conclusion to all this? Let's start with some figures to illustrate. First, it is estimated that throughout its lifetime, Overcast, Paperclip, Project 63, or whatever you want to call it, brought somewhere north of 1,600 German scientists to the US. It is further estimated that this resulted in $10 billion in patents and industrial processes. This has to be put into context to the US GDP of 1948, which was $258 billion, and to the Marshall Plan 1948-252 expenditure of $13 billion. So, after all, some economic gains were realized through the program. Yep, they made some money. Many of these gains stem from the military-industrial complex, some from more peaceful endeavors. For example, through patents out of paperclip and its German scientists came processes to sterilize fruit juice without heat and the churn butter at a rate of 1,500 pounds per hour. Hmm. Others lay somewhere in between. Von Braun rockets brought America to the moon, while also enabling the intercontinental delivery of nuclear payloads. As early as 1946, Von Braun wrote a letter to Oppenheimer at Los Alamos proposing adding Oppenheimer's bomb to his missile. Others again had positive impacts while hailing from abhorrent origins. For instance, the medical insights from the German Luftwaffe about hypothermia gained through brutal and horrific human experimentation in Dachau are one such case. 
To this day, it is debated whether the data gained from these experiments should be used. Some argue that it gives them some form of silver lining, while others maintain that they should be buried and forgotten. In either case, the insights continued to be further developed in the US after the end of the war, at times by the very perpetrators of the inhumane experiments to gather the data in the first place. It is paramount to remember that many of these so-called scientists who contributed to America's industrial, economic and military rise throughout the 50s and 60s were murderers, torturers, war criminals, racists, overall the very worst of human nature. The most notorious of these were probably the doctors, such as Schreiber and Blome, or the chemists and biologists such as Hitler's favorite chemist Ambrose. Von Braun is certainly not far removed either. Some, like Dr. Schreiber and Dr. Kurt Blume, were eventually confronted with their past crimes and were disgraced and dishonored as a result. Others, like von Braun, once more became national heroes, especially after taking charge at NASA and successfully bringing America to the moon. Many Americans saw von Braun as just that, an American hero. But even he, the mighty and beloved von Braun, could not completely escape his past. For example, one night before an Apollo mission, a reporter asked him whether he could guarantee that the rocket would not hit London. Von Braun angrily stormed out of the room as a result. Right. We are faced with the moral dilemma that the same people who committed unspeakable acts in the name of the Thousand Year Reich and the Führer soon did the same in the name of America, democracy and freedom. They did so <clears throat> in a time when the Cold War faced the world with existential threats to all of humanity. A time when whether we like it or not, and regardless of what side you sympathize with, Armageddon was only avoided by a balance of terror. Viewed from that perspective, the knowledge of these scientists, which truly had destructive capabilities, made sense to harness. If America hadn't, then the Soviets would have on top of what they already took on their own. Do you want to learn more about espionage and intelligence work during and after the Second World War? Then check out some of our other Spice and Ties videos. And if you want to know more about the Allied hunt for Nazi superweapons, we have a video on that. And I mentioned Erwin Respondek. If you want to see Astrid acting as Respondek's wife, which of course you do, those videos are around our heads somewhere. To get ever more content like this, join the Time Ghost army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com and we will see you soon in future, darlings. Right? Right. Right. right.